evening. And um, first, can I just say that um, we're going to record this. It's getting recorded, so um, it always works better if we can um, if we keep you keep your cameras switched off. So so if I, if I could ask you all to to switch your cameras off, then um, then 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 it'll work better. And I think um, perhaps the, we've got three speakers tonight, so perhaps the best way to, to handle it in terms of of um, questions is to um, if you if you if you have a question, if you can post it on the chat, and then we'll we'll have the three talks, and then we can deal with the questions at the end. I think I think that's probably the best thing to do, and then and then that'll that'll keep keep us all right with the timing. So so if if you can do that, that'll be great. Um, right, so um, just to start off, I'll, I'll introduce myself. I'm Paul Carter. I'm, I'm a lecturer at Sunderland and it's a pharmacy. And um, I'm also um, chair of the Hope Winch Society. Now, the Hope Winch Society was established in 1984, and um, it really is, is, is a society that, that, that links in with, with um, ex-students of pharmacy. So it's a, it's a large part of the alumni. So um, we have a reunion every year and we have um, newsletters going out. We're generally connecting with, with ex, ex, ex students and, and we, we also um, help out with the Hope Winch Benevolence Fund, which is a fund that is designed to, um, to, to help students who, have, um, find them, who find themselves in some financial difficulty. So um, I, th I think we might, we might be able to post details of the Hope Winch Benevolence Fund during the talks um, um, so, you, so you can have a little look at that and, and if you feel that you could contribute that would be great. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three speakers. We've got um, Sammy Hanna, uh, Louise Leiden and Tony Schofield. They're all community pharmacists and they've all got a, got a really interesting story to tell. Um, they're all ex-Sunderland, um, and I'm ex-Sunderland as well. Uh, I did my pharmacy a long time ago in Sunderland, and um, and 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 really, I'm I'm very proud of that. And um, and it's and I, and I feel it's, it's a privilege working closely with with the alumni network. I find that 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 when we, when we speak to graduates who've been out there working for a while, you, you find that the the, the generous and the, absolutely dedicated to the work and they're also the, the genuinely want to want to help students and to, to enhance the student experience and and, that, and that's what we've got tonight we've got we've got th three um graduates ex, ex, ex sunderland students who who are coming back um to, to help out so and, and and to share the story of what they've been doing so so that's great um we're celebrating our hundredth anniversary this year. It's our centenary year, so it's a hundred years since um, Hope Winch opened the doors of Sunderland in 1921. Um, very in, a remarkable lady, very inspired and um, and and um, dedicated, and um, and a lot's changed obviously since then. Um, still. She, the, the sort of subjects that were chosen and no, that, that was taught in those days, pharmaceutical chemistry was still still difficult then. I've I've, I've seen some of the exam papers from back then. Um, there was dispensing and there was there was there was the botany and pharmacognosy, uh, physiology. There wasn't there wasn't that much clinical stuff going on a hundred years ago, and that's that's one of the big changes that's occurred with pharmacy. Um, and and and. Also, I guess um, Sunderland itself has, has grown as a, as a pharmacy school, and now, of course, we've got um, we've got the, uh, the the medical school as well, and, and we've got the nurses, and we've got paramedics, and a whole load of other courses that that contribute to a a, a great learning experience. I, I think so, certainly for pharmacy students to be surrounded by all of this. So, so that's um, so I think I think it's time to introduce the speakers then. So. So let's go then. So the first, the first speaker is Sammy Hanna. Now, Sammy, um, he graduated from from Sunderland in 1998, 
Uh, and and when he was here, he was actually the um, he was the vice vice president of the SPSA as well. So he so he um, yeah he, he had a big a big contribution to the student life. Um, he's had a, a, quite a lot of experience. He worked for a national um, company and also an independence. But then he's he's really he's, he's his own manager now in um, in Lobley Hill Pharmacy in Gateshead. Now Sammy's. Um, He's, he's the communications officer um, and, and the vice chair for Gateshead and South Tyneside um, LPC. And, um, and, and he's also been um, really involved with um, delivering COVID vaccines um, um, to, to in, in, in his, his area, which is Whitley Bay. So, but I, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it for Sammy to, to talk to you about that. So um, if we can have if we can have Sammy then, and um, and I'll sign off. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege to be here, and thank you for being inviting me to to come and speak. So um, we're talking pharmacy in the real world. Um, I thought I'd just do a whistle stop with what I've been doing since I left university. I mean, I have fond memories of my time at Sunderland University. I was I was here 95 to 98 and made a lot of friends um, we worked hard. We played hard. We uh, I remember rushing to get assignments in on time, meeting deadlines, getting to labs on time, but we played hard as well. We I was as as, as just mentioned, I was a member of the uh, SPSA and I arranged the pharmacy ball and, and, and we had some really nice times. I also got opportunities to do other things as well. I, uh, I spent a summer um, organised for me to, to go and work in a, a pharmacy in Sweden, which allowed me to see the differences between Swedish pharmacy and, and, and UK pharmacy. So I had some really good opportunities at Sunderland and, um, and, and learned a lot of skills as well. At the end of that, um, I had to make a decision. Do I do community pharmacy industry or hospital? They were the three kind of choices at the time. There's a lot more these days, but um, back then that was the three that you kind of chose. And, and, I, and I picked community pharmacy because um, it felt like the right the right fit for me. I, I like speaking to people. I like um, interacting with people, and it, it seemed like the right thing for me to do. So I, I took that path. I went on to do my pre-reg with uh, with Boots the Chemist um, in Leeds. I left the northeast and moved down to Leeds, and and then following that, I spent five years working for Boots in in London. Um, I worked across quite a number of their pharmacy stores, very different stores, very unusual stores. Um, I, some, a couple of them to note, I, I worked at Heathrow Airport for um, a period of time where we really kind of, we pushed emergency supplies to the limit. Um, you can imagine a lot of travellers coming through for getting medication. We also set up an emergency doctor on telephone to, to help those patients. But equally, we had 50,000 staff working in the airport. So it was a town in its own right and we, it was a community in its own right. And, and we were with a healthcare professional on site. So we used to have a lot of regulars and people used to come and visit us at the pharmacy and it, and it was great. It was a really unusual um, place to work. I also worked in uh, in, in the uh, financial districts of, uh, of central London as well, which were again completely different um, make up a lot more um, affluent, shall we say. Um, very small stores taking in excess of kind of quarter of a million pounds a week. We used to have private drug registers, which were, would get filled up after one or two weeks, because um, that's how many kind of private prescriptions we did. Um, so it was un very, again, a, a different community, a different, uh, very unusual. I was also involved in working in the regional offices. Um, I helped to launch EHC across 200 pharmacies in, in, in the centre of London. Um, if you remember back then, EHC wasn't a, a product that pharmacies could sell or supply. It was um, just prescription only. So that was an exciting um, innovation at its time. Now it's kind of synonymous. Uh, every uh, pharmacy does EHC, but at the time it was quite exciting. I was also involved in some non-pharmacy project, projects for, for the company. I'm involved in other kind of uh, sales of insurance, for example, and launching that. I also opened a pharmacy for them within an underground station, which was really fascinating. If you think the GPHC standards are high, um, Transport for London standards are equally high and they change on a weekly basis and, and you had to keep changing to meet their ever-changing standards. So it was really fascinating and interesting time those few years. But then, then things had to change. I had to kind of make a decision. Was I going to move up north 
back up north or was I uh, going to stay in London? My wife or my fiance at the time was uh, she was from the northeast and she won that battle and I uh, ended up moving back up up to the northeast where I, I now live in Whitley Bay. I also took a, a change in my career as well. I decided to leave Boots and and work for uh, an independent, and that 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 was really good. And so it, it gave me a lot of opportunity to open up various services. I worked for a chap who had three pharmacies. Um, he he was really forward thinking and wanted various services set up, and and that gave me the opportunity to to set up things like weight loss services, minor ailments, phlebotomy, stop smoking services, and most importantly, he uh, he taught me a lot about independence. Um, he actually opened my eyes to the the opportunity to op- opening your own or buying your own um, pharmacy, which at that time I just didn't think was a possibility. So he was kind of a mentor to me, really. Um, so with his help and, and uh, kind of I met a lot of very interesting people and um, inspirational people. I met some of the other speakers, Tony and, and Louise and, and many of the people I work with now. I then took the plunge and bought a pharmacy. And that's where I, uh, I currently work at Lovely Hill in Gateshead. And I've been there for the last 14 years. But with it came a lot of other opportunities. I was involved in lots of other bits and pieces, um, the, which I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about now. We, we, I was involved in practice work, practice work in, in, in GP practices. Um, we used to go in and, and do half a day um, a week advising doctors and, and the practices. And it was really interesting to see the other side of the prescription, if you will. It was uh, it was really good and it was quite innovative at the time. It wasn't something that was being done as it is being done now. But then following a, a restructure of the NHS, um, they decided that they uh, didn't want to employ individual pharmacies, pharmacists, but they wanted to employ a, a company to do it. So a group of 10 of us came together and we set up a company and um and we uh, bidded for the service and we, we we won it and we got it and we operated it for about five or six years and and uh, until another restructure of the NHS uh, meant that we didn't need the company anymore. I also got involved in the LPC. The LPC is uh, the local pharmaceutical committee. It's the um, statutory body that represents community pharmacies to um, to the NHS. So as a contractor, I, I um, was elected on as a, a committee member. And uh, after a little while, I was given the opportunity to become the communications officer and vice chair. And that that's been instrumental in, in me being involved in all sorts of other stuff. Um, from a communications point of view, I was involved in setting up um, or, or taking the communications that were there already. Um, we used to have a weekly or bi-weekly newsletter that went out in paper form. We moved that into electronic. Um, we, we built a web. Or I built a website, and and it's grown and and developed over the years. We've then included feeds and and communication channels that of some of the more newer ways of communicating: Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp. Um, so so that that was very interesting and and has been um, really good. Um, as a committee, we're a small committee, um, very focused and very, um, I'm very privileged to work with some of the people on that committee, if, if I'm honest, um, very forward thinking, very um, um, looking at the future, wanting to progress pharmacy. We spent a lot of time trying to raise the awareness of community pharmacy, try and build relationships with local NHS leaders. We're involved in some of the politics. Um, I'm sure, as you know, whilst patients value community pharmacy, the national bodies don't always, uh, or the national policy doesn't always follow that. So we've worked hard to try and kind of increase the profile of community pharmacy, both locally and nationally. We've worked with some of the national bodies. Um, I've I've even had to speak at a national conference once, which was quite nerve wracking. (laughs) Um, Sometimes we've managed to influence policy, sometimes not. Having said that, um, I do think the pandemic that's just been has kind of done a lot um for us politically it's kind of really cemented the community pharmacy um it's been a real roller coaster of a year um but we've managed to keep our doors open and, and managed to keep serving communities and uh, really cemented the role of the community pharmacy it made a big difference throughout the pandemic but by far the biggest area that i've worked on with the lpc is service development and um services for community pharmacies um as a, as a committee, we've worked hard on adapting to all the changes that the NHS have um, have come about. There's, there's always changes. Um, 
We've implemented Farm Outcomes. I've been heavily involved in Farm Outcomes, which is an online platform for um, gathering data and increasing the efficiency of um, uh, uh, payments and um, claims from community pharmacies to their commissioners. We've, um, we've used it across many of our services and, and built many, many modules across it and have become a bit of a, um, a bit of a, I know how it works, put it that way very well. We've also set up a, a separate company called PSNE, which um, that was really, again, because the structures of the NHS required um, a company to hold contracts for community pharmacies rather than contracting direct. We set that up and I've been heavily involved in that and, and that's helped us to develop some of the services that we've got. Some of the services that we, 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 we've kind of done over the years are things like health checks, weight loss clinics, many of the public health services which are now synonymous with uh, community pharmacy. But some of the more interesting or what I would say innovative services have actually now been picked up nationally as well. Um, we, we, we're quite good at innovating in the northeast, I believe, and um, some of these services have now gone on to um, become national services within the national community pharmacy contract. Um, we had an emergency supply service, um, we had transfer of care from hospitals to community pharmacy services, both of which have been rolled into the, the newly launched CPCS service, which is um, going to now be running from GP practices. But again, locally, we've got our own transfer of care service from GP practices to, to pharmacies, something called GP2P. This was an innovative service that we all kind of worked quite hard on and launched. And it also includes a bunch of PGDs, which we, we can use. So when a GP does send a patient over to a community pharmacy, we can, we, we can give them more um, by using PGDs. And, and probably the biggest area that I've kind of been involved in is the flu. Um, when I very first moved to the northeast, we, we the LPC was looking to upskill community pharmacists so they were ready to offer flu services, and we did training, but but we couldn't get an inroad. Um, the local NHS leaders wouldn't give us a chance; they just kind of put us off year on year. But then one year we did get a chance, and we we we've got a a small service running, and it was quite successful. And then the following year that grew, and then it became a regional service, and then it started to. Um, form some of the national service and, and now flu services and vaccination services are again part of the uh, the national contract and 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 you, you couldn't think of a pharmacy not offering vaccination services now and that's helped us in the covid pandemic as well um working through the lpcs we we've managed to get pharmacies community pharmacies working in the vaccination hubs which has been great um, we've, we've now been vaccinating in people's homes and I mean, I'm sure Louise is going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, a group of pharmacists have been going out and, and vaccinating um, housebound patients. And, and to top it off now, uh, I just got a approval yesterday to allow us to open a community pharmacy led vaccination centre in, in my hometown of Whitley Bay. So that's very exciting. The, uh, the challenge now is to try and turn it around in seven days, which is what I've been given. My inbox is full of uh, emails that I have to deal with now, but that's a really exciting challenge and something I'm very much looking forward to. So I hope that's given you a bit of a, a summary of kind of my career to date and, and, and where I, uh, what I've been up to. Um, what I would say to the students that are kind of on on listening is um, I, I feel privileged to have had my uh, pharmacy education in Sunderland. It um, never ceases to amaze me anywhere I've been. I've always bumped into people from Sunderland and who've been who've done the pharmacy degree in Sunderland and they're always held in high esteem. It gives you a real bedrock um, to, to the start of your career. And and all I would say is just grasp any opportunities that come your way, um, even if it's not necessarily something that you think is going to be um, is going to propel your career in the future. Each each phase prepares you for the next phase in your career. And, and that's irrespective of where you end up, whether you end up in hospital, um, whether you end up in industry or whether you end up in community pharmacy. Um, however, I am a little bit biased and I would say the path should be community pharmacy. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Sammy. That was uh... Wow, what a what a whirlwind um, tour of, um, of of services! It's um, it's it, it sounds really really exciting. Um, so if if anyone's got um, 
quest questions we're going to leave them to the to the end if, if that's okay and and then we'll, we'll we'll use the chat function um okay we'll move straight on then to um to, to our next speaker then now our next speaker is uh, louise leiden so um louise graduated from the university in uh, 2000 and she bought her first pharmacy in Jarrow in 2004. She um, expanded a group um, in 2011 and now has four pharmacies. And she's also secretary of the Gateshead and South Tyne LPC. So, and, and I know Louise has been very involved with um, the local COVID vaccination programme. And I think, I think she might be talking a little bit about that. Um, so I'll hand I'll hand you over to Louise. Excellent. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Sorry if my eyes are flickering between two screens because I'm just um, I'm just going through some notes on my laptop as well. So as Dr. Corder said, I'm Louise Leiden. I'm a Sunderland graduate. I was the Millennium um, graduation year, the first of the four year M Farm program. Um, I went on to do my pre reg. Um, in community pharmacy and it was not the path I was thinking I was going to take. I was um, very much in favour of, of working in, in research I am um, and I went and done a, a summer placement at Searle in Morpeth and um, Dr Carter was kind enough to help me secure that post um, and for all I loved the, the industry and working in the research what I did really miss was people um, I'm a bit of a chatterbox and I think that um, working in a, a, a quiet research type environment didn't suit me. So I, um, I opted to do a community pre-reg um, and I worked for Superdrug and I worked across three, three pharmacies, Ashington, Sunderland and Newcastle, Eldon Square. So I got a, a really good um, breadth of experience working in three very different, three de very different settings. I went on then to work for an independent group for a couple of years and um, I took the plunge very early in my career and bought a pharmacy in Jarrow, which is where I grew up. Um, so it was quite exciting to be back back on my home ground um, and seeing quite a lot of daily patients who I'd been to school with and knew my family and knew different members of the, the different members of the family and neighbours and whatnot. So it was um it, it was quite daunting at the start, but it was um, it was it was quite enjoyable to see all of these uh, familiar faces. Um, I went on in 2011 to um, Dubai and another three pharmacies, all in the Durham area. Um, again, all in very deprived areas, so areas where we're dealing with a lot of social deprivation, um, inequalities, lots of local challenges. And what I what I learned very early on was that. I need to really understand my patients. I need to understand what matters to them. I need to know my 15 streets. Um, I need to get out in the community and find find ways that I can I can help address some of these inequalities through um, designing different services to meet their needs. So that's that's where my heart really lies. It's in the community. Um, I'm definitely attracted to um, addressing these social inequalities and, and doing what I can in my role as a pharmacist. Um, and again, in my role as the LPC secretary, I'm very involved in lots of alliancing um, with the local council, the CCGs, the primary care networks. Um, and it's all about relationship building. It's really about investing the time and getting to know the other stakeholders out there. And obviously, investing the time means that you're building up a relationship. And with that relationship comes the trust and the connections in the real value and I think that's that's really come to the forefront in the pandemic where community pharmacy in our areas in in South Tyneside and in the northeast has really been valued. So a few of the things that we've been involved in over the years I'll just give you a little little whistle stop tour. So community pharmacy in the real world well for me that's on social housing estates that's where I belong um, and that's where that's where I feel best suited. Um, you know, very keen to get involved in the the role that community pharmacists can play in public health, from screening, education, and primary prevention. And I think over the years, um, we've definitely seen a shift in the, the attitudes towards pharmacists, from us being um, sort of badged as experts in medicine, to to becoming you know professionals that are committed to provide patient centred care. And I think that's really key. 
is that we need to make sure that our patients are at the center of the care. We really need to ask the patient what matters to them and make sure that, you know, we're getting them really involved and they've, they've got buy-in and um, they're influencing how, how services are developed. And, we, you know, we've really got our ear to the ground to make sure that what we're doing is going to help that population. And then with that comes sort of unintended consequences, I guess. Um, you know, the patients tend to take a little bit more ownership for their health and a bit more responsibility um, by connecting them in to the decision making. It, it does really, really help. So in my areas where I work, um, you know, the deprivation I've, I've mentioned is, is pretty high. The challenges we face, for example, in Jarrow, looking on some of the data on South Tyneside Council's um, website in, in, in South Tyneside, in the most deprived areas, there's a, you know, over an eight years life expectancy gap. So for example, a gentleman living in Cleveland Village would be expected to die maybe eight to 10 years later than somebody living in some of the deprived areas, such as um, some of the council estates in the, the ward, such as the Bead Ward in Jarrow. But over the last 10 years, the death rate for all men in South Tyneside has started to change. And I believe a lot of that is due to not just the input of community pharmacists, but sort of the long term conditions alliance and groups and, um, you know, forward thinking alliance in between public health and and the CCGs. Um, where, whereby the LPC, our local committee and the members on the committee are very plugged into that um, to making the changes and influencing the decisions there. Some of the some of the, the projects and um, and work that we've been involved in over the last sort of four to five years. When you think of community pharmacy, you think you're going to be behind your dispensary bench a lot of your time. And I think maybe five, six years ago, that was very much the case. But um, I can't believe actually how much time I am spending out of my pharmacy and truly in the community. Some of the work I've been doing over the last few years has, has been really, really rewarding. Um, it's been emotionally draining, um, but really satisfying. I've been heavily involved with a local charity called Hospitality and Hope, and that supports um, a lot of low-income families. It has a food bank, and it also has um, a soup kitchen and um, you know meals provided for the homeless. Um, I've been going into Hospitality and Hope, um, providing flu jabs, doing outreach work with with the homeless folk of South Tyneside. Um, I've done COPD micro spirometry screening. Um, we had a, a healthy lung month. Then a month later, we had healthy heart, a healthy heart month. And we did blood pressure monitoring and atrial fibrillation screening, lots of little interventions and support. And we actually managed to refer four patients on the back of, of those results. Um, a lot of it is just spending time with the patients um, talking to them, answering queries about a lot of the medication they take, both um, prescribed and illicitly bought on the streets. But it's just, it was, it was really innovative, innovative to get a, a professional into that environment, a health professional, because there had been no interventions. Um, these patients, a lot of them hadn't seen, um, hadn't seen a GP for a decade hadn't had the blood pressure checked, hadn't spoke to anybody about their concerns. Um, and quite a few of those patients now have managed to get um, registered with a GP, which has been you know, really powerful. Some of the, the other sort of um, work we've been doing, mobile work, as Sammy said, um, regarding the flu service, we've been leaving our community pharmacies and going out and running flu clinics in the community. So that could be in... Um, community centres or different venues, mosques, churches, um, really sort of getting into the hard to reach um, populations in the community who don't routinely access the GP or sometimes the pharmacy. So we've been, we've been mobile in that respect. We've also um, in South Tyneside been delivering flu services to all the local schools and um, council workers on site to enable um, a good uptake of the, the flu jab. So that's that's again been a service commission through the LPC and again very rewarding. Being, being part of the LPC has allowed lots of services to be negotiated and um, 
brought about in South Tyneside. Um, Sammy's mentioned the GP, the pharmacy service, which is um, a service where the GP essentially refers the patient to the pharmacy to not block up a, a GP appointment. Um, a, quite a few patients self-refer as well now, um, and we're hoping to increase that in the coming months. And that's, you know, allowing pharmacists to, um, to really use their clinical skills to um, not only prescribe um, P medications on the minor ailment scheme, but to use um, PGDs to prescribe a lot of prescription only medicines. So, you know, we had training courses um, about three years ago, and we had over, over 100 pharmacists trained in clinical examinations, so ENOs and throat examinations, you know, examining, examining and screening um, chest sounds and, and basically what you're doing at university now, but you have to remember some of us older pharmacists didn't have those um, skill sets. So it was a real achievement to have our, our community pharmacists clinically trained um, with those skill sets as well. Um, probably the service that we're, you know, we're most proud of at the moment has, has been a team of 22 community pharmacists who've given up their weekends um, since not long after Christmas to vaccinate all of the housebounds in South Tyneside. So all three of the speakers tonight have been involved um, alongside another another 19 pharmacists. And we've been going out um, with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, um, been going out eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, sometimes not getting finished till eight o'clock on a Saturday night, then going back out on Sunday for the same again. Um, and it's been phenomenal. We've, we've sort of managed to, each of us has been vaccinating, you know, around 30, 35 patients a day, um, which, you know, it, it's, it's quite hard going. You think that doesn't sound like many, but having to get into the patient's house with the mobility issues, having to get them all organised, sat down, layers of clothing off, um, you know, going through the, the consultation, quite often making them a cup of tea or rearranging the furniture or doing something else because the, the poor souls haven't seen anybody for weeks and weeks. So we've um, we've all been doing that on a weekend, which has been you know absolutely rewarding and you know so worthwhile. It's um it's really opened my eyes to to see what goes on in the community. You know, getting behind patients' front doors and actually seeing inside somebody's house is is so different to seeing a patient present in the pharmacy. Um, so it's been a real privilege to be in a position to do that. Um, and I think it shows. It shows really what community pharmacy is capable of. You know, community pharmacists working truly in the community and um, visiting patients in their own homes. I don't think it can get, you know, any more grassroots and coal face than than actually doing that. So it's been it's been a real honour to do that. What I would say, just a little bit of part and advice is, you know, whatever you do in your careers, if you know, if you work in community pharmacy hospital. Um, in a patient-facing role, you know, always do it with with passion, but always do it with care. <clears throat> always think, you know, whatever decisions you make, always think, think with a caring head, because I think if you put the patient at the forefront and you, you think about, you know, their feelings and their sentiments and and how it affects them, um, it'll just make you so much more of a you know, so it just make your job so much more rewarding, but it'll make you, um, you know, a really, really skilled pharmacist. The, the academic, the academic qualifications is an absolute must, and um, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything to the contrary, but by caring and showing that you understand the patient and you take a little bit of time to, you know, find out what matters to them, um, it'll become so empowering um, and make your job so much more rewarding. So thank you very much for. For listening to me this evening. All right, thanks, Louise. Um, you've given us plenty to think about, and um, and 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 you've also shown how 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 community pharmacists can make such a such a big difference um in the community. So um, that's great. We'll move seamlessly on, um, and we're going to take questions after after Tony, and um. So, so I'll, in, I'll introduce Tony now. Um, Tony Schofield graduated from um, 
Polytechnic, Sunderland, um, back in 1978. So he was a little bit before my time. Um, and he's based in, in, in Saddle Shields in a flag called Pharmacy. Um, he's established and runs a chain of pharmacies with his business partner, Steve Gill. Um, and that's, that's throughout the Northeast. So he's got a lifetime of experience in community pharmacy and um, and I'll, I'll pass I'll pass you over to, to Tony. Good evening, folks. Um, you've just had two really inspirational talks and I know these two individuals very well. And I can tell you that they don't just talk the talk, they do walk the walk. They absolutely do do what they say they do and an awful lot more. If they had more than 15 minutes to talk, you'd be amazed at what these two have been up to. Um, I must correct one thing. Uh, I didn't qualify. I didn't get my degree in 1978. I got it in 1977. Uh, I got my degree on the 7th of the 7th, 77. So it's all the sevens. Uh, it's supposed to be lucky, um, but that was me. I think I'm not going to talk too much about me and my career and what I've done, but I'm going to touch on a number of things which I think are relevant, and I'll illustrate them by examples from my career. Um, I think the, the thing to bear in mind is that I think about my grandmother. When she was my age, she had experienced the Wright brothers flying. She'd experienced uh, air travel, um, airliners. Uh, she'd seen Concorde and she was alive for the moon landing. Uh, that's an incredible technological uh, growth, if you think about it. But it's nothing compared to the technological growth that we're currently in the middle of. And it can, it's only going to get faster. Um, if you look now, with autom automation, data retrieval, artificial intelligence, and the thing that really fascinates me, which is uh, pharmacogenomics, um, it's an incredible time to be around, and you are qualifying at a stupendous time to go and make the mark. Um, if you want to look at uh, an, a, an example of this huge increase in uh, knowledge and uh, availability to employ that knowledge. Look at the development of the COVID vaccinations. Um, how long would a vaccine take uh, in, in, the last, in, in the last 20 years? We still don't have a vaccine for AIDS, which is a, a disease of the 1980s. So there's an example of the, um, how fast things are moving. I think one of the most important things that I've learned is that partnerships are a good thing. If you think about the ideal partnership, it's a, a salesman and a craftsman. There are no overlapping skills whatsoever. So nobody can say, God, I could have done that better. But somebody can sell what's being made. He's got nothing to sell if the guy who's making it doesn't make it. But the guy who's making it can't make a living if it's not being sold from. There are no overlapping skills, but it works perfectly. That's the ideal situation. What you'll probably find is that most people don't have arrangements like that and where you've got too many overlapping skills you'll find that um, people get resentful of each other etc but where you do have a, a small number of overlapping skills but a, quite a dichotomy of other skills so for instance practical skills as opposed to legal skills clinical skills um, the mixture's all important for getting the, the brew right and I'm going to illustrate this uh, in a number of ways I think the first one is in my pharmacy business, my partner Steve Gill is uh, very skilled at lots of practical things. Uh, he's very good with dealing with people. I was very good at negotiating the contracts, uh, getting the dispensing contracts that were required, which were um, deemed you know, the, the, the necessary and desirable route, et cetera, which you may or may not, about, not, not know about. We do have overlapping skills for both pharmacists. Um, but we've been very successful, and uh, I'm not going to um, dwell on that too much, but I never thought I'd be as successful as we have been. It's been great. The other thing that I got involved in, which was tremendously uh, exciting, was in the early 2000s, um, the National Health Service under Gordon Brown and um, Tony Blair became an exciting place to be. They were prepared to invest in innovation and they were prepared to encourage people to innovate. And um, I became a prescriber in early 2004, when the first cohort qualified at Sunland, of course. And uh, 
went into business, in inverted commas, with two GPs, a counsellor. I don't mean a town counsellor. I mean somebody has counselling skills. And I was a pharmacist. And we formed what was called a social enterprise, which is a not-for-profit company. And we bid to provide drug treatment services in South Tyneside. And the different skills that you encountered as you were having to develop um, were very, very important. And learning from others was important. I did not know what a drug worker was. Um, only by working with drug workers and seeing the rapport that they get with a, 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 an alcoholic or an opiate dependent person and how they help them get uh, the support that they require in terms of employment, in terms of financial uh, assistance, um, dealing with debt, dealing with benefit queries, dealing with divorces, relationship problems and all this sort of thing was an eye opener. But they didn't know what a pharmacist did. And a pharmacist in a, a community pharmacy sees the patients every day. They come in every day for the, uh, for the medication. And we are in a fantastic position to um, note deteriorating condition if somebody's health is, is, is going wrong uh, and report back and help support the whole team. And really, teamwork is um, all important because nobody has all the skills to do everything. Um, in the time that I was working in the social enterprise, which is about eight years, uh, I won the first, sorry, I wrote the first controlled drug prescription by a non-medical prescriber in the UK uh, for methadone. And in 2006, I won the Pharmaceutical Care Award, which is a, um, an award which is organised by the Pharmaceutical Journal. And that was for work I did in the detox clinic in South Shields and in the social enterprise um, that we set up in the whole of South Tyneside. I was also a member for some years of the Primary Care Trust Board. There's no such thing as a Primary Care Trust now. When I first qualified, there were family practitioner committees, then they became family health service uh, authorities, then they became area health authorities, then they became uh, primary care groups, they then became primary care trusts, then they became CCGs, clinical commissioning groups, and they're going to move into something else soon. But for the period of time of the Primary Care Trust, uh, it, the trusts in South Tyneside, Gateshead and Sunderland were merged and I became the pharmacist uh, on that group. And that really was uh, a time to notice or, or to get involved in joint working with people. You had people with skills completely outside of clinical skills. And if anybody wants to go into healthcare, becoming an accountant isn't a bad idea. The money dictates everything. Uh, if you've got the cash to do it, if you can raise the cash to do it, uh, if you haven't got the money to do it, what are you going to do about it? Um, staying within budget, keeping everybody happy. The skills in that are incredible. And I really, really did gain a respect for NHS managers who get a hell of a lot of um, trouble, uh, criticism because some of them are expensive. Um, and I'm not going to defend the NHS as an organisation because the, the way that it's organised is very, very wasteful. But the people that I encountered were very good, all had their hearts in the right place and did a great job. So it was a privilege to work with them. And um, it's worth noting, actually, this worry about privatisation of the health service that we keep hearing about really gathered uh, some sort of momentum back in the uh, early 2000s under a Labour government. And one of the things that I do remember is that there was a hospital in um, uh, North Tyneside near Wall's End that the trust, all the primary care trusts, which you remember were government organisations, were obliged to spend a certain amount of money with this hospital to get it on its feet. It was a private hospital and it was given public money to get it going, basically. Uh, so privatising the NHS is um, a very emotive service, but uh, private providers have long been involved in providing NHS services. And I suppose the biggest example, of course, is the um, uh, GPs and pharmacists. They are independent contractors run as private businesses and they contract with the National Health Service to provide services. Um, I am not one of those that thinks that uh, more privatisation would be a bad thing. 
I think certainly for pharmacy, uh, having uh, more people funding treatment, as happens in um, the continent, particularly in Holland, Belgium, and in Southern Ireland, where uh, a, a lot of private health insurance is involved, would give us the opportunity, A, there is more chance of somebody backing innovation if they think it's going to work. So I think that some of the ideas that Louise and Sammy were talking about would have advanced a lot faster if we had uh, private providers who we could sell these ideas to. And then if they don't work, we could walk away from them. But if they do work, then we could take them forward. I also think that having a variety of providers who we could negotiate with to provide services would help us financially. I think that having the one funder, the National Health Service, has certainly counted against us all of my career. Um, and I think that it would give individual pharmacies more clout in determining their own terms and services if they were dealing with a variety of providers. So I don't want to get into this privatisation is such a bad thing. But by the same token, I do know that most of the people that want to provide NHS services want to cherry pick and they don't want to do the difficult ones. So anybody wanting to get involved would have to do everything as far as I was concerned. Um, some of the high points and the, the landmarks during my career, the first one was before I qualified in 1977, and that was the migral case. The migral case was a situation where a patient with a headache had gone to uh, the GP who had prescribed migral, which is ergotamine, and it was prescribed for um, migraine. Uh, the maximum dose was 12 tablets in a week. And this doctor prescribed two tablets three times a day, and uh, the patient, after three or four days, went back to the doctor. Bear in mind, that's two days supply, two tablets three times a day, six tablets, two days, 12. That's your, your maximum weekly dose done in two days. After three or four days, she went to the doctor and said she felt terrible. And uh, actually, she didn't go. She got his partner out. And the partner visited the house and said, keep taking the tablets. I'm sure you'll be fine. But a fortnight later, she had a leg amputated and she sued both the practice and the GP surgery uh, and the pharmacy. Now, at the time, the pharmacist would probably just said, well, I just said what the, what the GP said. You know, the GP wanted it, it's his fault. But the outcome was that both parties were held to be responsible jointly and 50-50 uh, for the, the injury this lady got because the pharmacy was expected to use its clinical knowledge to veto a prescription if they weren't happy with it. And to be fair, that liberated us. It moved us straight out of the issue of just compounding and making stuff up and putting labels on bottles. It gave us not only the responsibility, but the right to challenge decisions. And it made us, we had to up our game to be challenging doctors. And I was around at the time that this had just started and it was tricky. Lots of doctors approaching retirement age had never been challenged and they didn't take to it kindly. So you develop skills in uh, discussing this sort of stuff. I realize we never get that situation now, once in a blue moon. Um, the next one was in 1996 when for the first time, pharmacies prescribed needle exchange, prescribing advice uh, to care homes and in some cases to GP practices and were paid to do so. That was the beginning of the link between supply of pharmacy, uh, you know, selling drugs uh, and, and dispensing medicines and remuneration went at a national level. We started being prescribed for providing advice, the needle exchange scheme wasn't necessarily an item of service thing. It was an all-inclusive in, all in, uh, um, service, including advice on uh, in, uh, injection injuries and all this sort of thing. And we were paid to provide it for the first time in the mid-1990s. 1998, there was the Boots Peppermint Water case. And this was a case where um, basically somebody uh, as a result of a dispensing error in making up a uh, a compound which needed peppermint water in it, they got the dilution wrong, and it was a, a medication for a, a small baby who died. And as a result of that, basically, the dispensing medicines by making them up from scratch in, in dispensaries stopped almost overnight. The uh, MHRA, uh, etc., insisted that we had... Um, audit trails for every ingredient, including expiry dates, and the paperwork became crazy. 
that's when special labs, special slabs came into their forte and they uh, did this for us for a fee and the drug tariff was amended so we were reimbursed for it. But it stopped us uh, almost overnight making stuff up in dispensaries. I used to make powders when I first qualified. I used to make ointments and creams regularly. We used to make very awkward and uh, difficult mixtures, in some cases containing mixtures of, uh, of, of cocaine, heroin, uh, uh, Logactyl, which is um, an antipsychotic, and in some cases different alcohols, brandy, um, gin, etc. And I know you're laughing. I can't hear you, but I know you're laughing. And we did make up stuff like that. Overnight, that stopped. Um, in again in the 1990s, that's when myself and Sammy referred to it earlier, uh, providing prescribing advice to GPs. Um, formularies were developed in uh, the finest restaurants in Newcastle or Sunderland on a Thursday night by um, drug companies who pretending that they were providing uh, educational services to GPs were actually feeding them uh, on the finest food and the, the most expensive brandies and cigars uh, available and funnily enough it translated into their products being prescribed. So we needed a sea change in attitude. And uh, the first thing that pharmacists involved in this sort of work did was to develop formularies with GPs. And I was terrified when I first went into this, really believing that the GPs would be trying to uh, tra catch me out on knowledge or whatever. And I couldn't have been more wrong. They were brilliant. They wanted to know what we had to offer, uh, what we had to say. They would ask us questions. They'd give us time to come back with the answer. They accepted if we didn't know the answer because they themselves didn't know the answers. Um, and unfortunately, the, the whole prescribing advice, we, the, one of the practices that I was involved in saved £100,000 budget in the first year. That was replicated across the patch. Unfortunately, the, uh, the commissioners expected that to happen uh, every year. And of course, there's a point at which you can't make savings. Um, you've dragged it down to, the, to rock bottom. And I, I start, started losing interest, as I'm sure Sammy did, when the exercise of working in a doctor's practice was just about saving money. Um, in 1999, the Crown report was published. June Crown published this report, and it was about alternative ways of supplying medicines. And basically, this was the foundation for uh, non-medical prescribing. Uh, I did the first course at Sunderland in 2003, um, took the first exam uh, February 2004, and uh, became a prescriber uh, in, in March 2004. I told you about writing controlled pr drug prescriptions, but at the time uh, when you qualified, you were a supplementary prescriber and you had an independent prescriber who wrote a clinical management plan. But that clinical management plan, to be fair, would have um, could have said to manage hypertension with every drug in the BNF. Uh, that would be the amount of scope you would have to do on it. But it may not be. It may be to, to manage a, a patient on one drug and to go back to the independent prescriber, depending on how much leeway they gave you. What we found was that doctors really respected pharmacists and um, they were happy to give us uh, quite a lot of leeway. But very quickly after, we didn't need to worry about it because by 2005, uh, we could qualify as independent prescribers in our own right. And I've been an independent prescriber since 2005. And again, I got the qualification at Sunderland. Um, one interesting development, I talked earlier about the uh, social enterprise that I was involved with, where we were prescribing uh, opiates to uh, people who are dependent upon opiates. Um, when we set it up, we realised that uh, we tried to, to say who was going to do what. And one of the things was that uh, somebody was going to have to take care of pregnant drug users. And um, nobody actually felt comfortable about doing it. And I'm talking, we had two GPs involved in, as directors, and we employed a number of GPs as well, and none of them were comfortable about doing it. So I went on a course. I went to see, uh, went for a series of lectures in, in uh, Sheffield, and there was an obstetrician from Glasgow who was fantastic. And after spending something like three hours listening to her, and having lunch with her and having a chat. When I came back, I was the go-to man for managing pregnant drug users. And actually, it wasn't that difficult. It was dead easy. Um, when you know and you're confident and you know what your uh, limits are, and you don't exceed those limits, then everything's fine, particularly when you're properly supported. 
But I was a pharmacist. I'd only been prescribing a couple of years. And all of a sudden, I'm the man in the organization handling all the, all the pregnant drug users. And there were quite a few of them at the time. Um, and this sort of thing will happen to all of you. Um, now, I know there's a lot of worry about prescribing and its incorporation into the degree course. And I know that a lot of you will be concerned about this because you're going to think that the next cohorts are going to come in armed with something you don't have. Well, I understand that uh, Keith Ridge, the um, chief pharmaceutical officer, um, has brought about a portfolio way of uh, getting you into getting the skills. Uh, if you think about it, if you're standing behind the counter in a pharmacy selling a medication, be it a painkiller, be it something for period pain, be it uh, anything, uh, you're making a prescribing decision. And a lot of the principles are the same. There is not some magical um, academic right to make you into a prescriber. And as a consequence, it should be quite easy for you to make the change, particularly since things are being geared towards pharmacist prescribers. And one thing that I will say is that most people uh, very much respect pharmacists because they are they think differently. From the beginning, you are uh, working with um, drug interactions uh, and various uh, comorbidities and thinking in those terms. In the early days, you'd go to a diabetic nurse who would think about diabetes. You'd go to a cardiovascular nurse who'd think about um, heart disease. You'd go to a, 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 a nurse who would specialise in rheumatology. Nobody thought across all of those, but pharmacists do. And we are respected by everybody in the health community as a consequence. Conclusions I've come to in the time that I've been working. I mentioned that pharmacists are respected by healthcare professionals. Every doctor you encounter will have been saved by a pharmacist at some point in his career, probably when he was a houseman, probably early in his career. But every one of them, whatever they might like to believe otherwise, has been saved by a pharmacist. So you have that in your favour the minute you engage with them. You don't need to ram this sort of thing down people's throats. You just need to understand that you do have their respect. The pharmaceutical industry is evil. I'm afraid it is. The pharmaceutical industry is a wonderful organization which, uh, or a wonderful body, which uh, we've seen what they've done with the COVID vaccinations. But the way that the pharmaceutical industry has promoted medicines over the years, until relatively recently, although they still will if they can get away with it, has been appalling. Um, I am aware that we're running out of time. Uh, but I would like to say one thing. At the moment, we have a lot of turmoil going on. But turmoil is good for new entrants. In turmoil, there's always opportunity. And I know that the people that we're talking to here tonight will have what it takes to actually exploit that opportunity and to have decent careers. When I qualified, I never expected to own my own business. But I do, and it's a significant and substantial business now. I never expected to write a prescription. When I qualified, the thought of pharmacist prescribers was just a joke. I never expected to be arrested, but I have. And I never expected to win a fellowship from the Pharmaceutical Society, and I have. You're going to come across all sorts of things in your lives. You've qualified from Sunderland. It is a fantastic place. I've had pre-registration students until very recently and a lot of the staff at Sunderland I know very well and have worked with. You could not be taught by better people. You'd probably be taught by people as good somewhere else, but they won't be better. So, last thoughts, go out and enjoy it. Take care. All right, thanks, Tony. That was that was great. And uh, again, plenty to think about. And, um, and Everyone's and, still awake. Oh, and the emphasis on, on, on partnerships and teamwork really came across across there. So can I ask all the speakers to come back on online then and we'll, we'll handle a few questions. Um, has, uh, is, is Sammy there? Yeah. Ah, hiya, hiya. Okay. Um, I'll, we've, we've got we've got um, we've got quite a few questions. We'll see how we'll see how it goes. Um, I, I don't want to run over time too much. Um, okay, let's let's go. One from David. What do the speakers think that community pharmacists of the future will be doing, say in five and ten years' time, compared to today? And I, th I think that's that's because 
you know, pharmacy seems to be changing so much. Um, can we can we go, Louis, Louise? Do you want to do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I know what I'd like to think pharmacy would be doing, and that would be more heavily involved, um, for sure, um, with the communities, um, a lot more service development, a lot more, um, you know, a lot more freedom for pharmacists to make more decisions, for to influence um, service provision, um, for to be for to be there at the decision making table with, you know, we're looking in South Tyneside and and largely in Gateshead that we were well plugged, but I know in a lot of other areas, community pharmacists don't have these same opportunities to develop services. So I would like to think that was, um, you know, bread and butter business for community pharmacy moving forward. Right, right. Sammy, do you want to? Do you want to? No, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, uh, you, you can see that new, as I was saying, there's a lot of services. Um, we, we talked a lot more about services than supply of medicines, haven't we, tonight? I think all three of us have. And, and I think it's going to, the future will just be more and more of that. And, and, and maybe at some stage we'll all will be prescribers and we will be the first port of call for people to come to us before being sent to, to other medical services. So, yeah. Yeah. Tony? Yeah, well, clearly I agree with all of that, um, but I, I do think that um, I don't know what a pharmacy is going to look like. Um, you know, Amazon, I believe, have just bought a pharmacy from um, what they call them, Lloyd's. I believe it's in the northeast. I have no idea what that's going to look like. I think there will be a lot fewer pharmacies, um, and I think those pharmacies that uh, that remain will have more pharmacists in them. Um, I don't know what ownership of them will look like. Uh, but I think I, I would say we will be a lot more involved in uh, managing long term conditions. Um, my, we'll, we'll certainly moved on from um, handling minor ailments. Uh, we will have incredibly new skills because they will develop to meet the, the, the demands. There are, there's been a shortage of recruitment of uh, practice nurses and GPs. Um, getting doctors to, to may not be such a problem since the pandemic, but GPs are diminishing in number. The practices themselves are merging. And I think we'll see that happening with pharmacies. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, moving on then very quickly. Um, Claudia is is wondering if um, do, do, do people, do, do, do the public actually use these services? And then she's got a supplementary question um, and she'd like some advice um, for someone starting pre-registration training in community pharmacy. I think we'll have to be brief with this. <laughs> so I don't know, Lu Louise, do you want to, uh, we're stuck, stuck in, in that, in that, this, this route. Yeah. So if do you want, do you want to have a, just, just. Yeah. I any? mean, I think there's probably no, there's probably no answer that applies to all pharmacies there because the service uptake is very much dependent on, on what the need is in that area. So say for example, some of the deprived areas might have a lot more um, stop smoking appointments and a lot more, um, you know, methadone supervisions or needle exchanges than in other areas. But um, I mean, as an example, um, some of the services that that I provide, um, like an anticoagulation service, we're talking about thousands of patients that we look for, not just not just a handful. It's um, it's big numbers of, of patients. Um, likewise, in the flu season, um, community pharmacists aren't just vaccinating one and two patients. It's it's hundreds of patients that we're vaccinating. So I think um, the footfall for the services is, is in pharmacy is definitely increasing. Um, patients are recognising where they can go for those services. Um, so yeah, I think um, the numbers are substantial for quite quite a few of the services now. Yeah, I would I would say that patients do avail themselves of services, um, and I think that now that there's a lot more private services about in more affluent areas, people are availing themselves of it. It's not quite the same take up in. Uh, less affluent areas, but I think that will come. Um, one thing I, I forgot to say was that um, I think that some of the smaller pharmacies out away from uh, town centres, but on suburban estates and uh, um, little villages have blossomed during the pandemic. There's a lot, a lot of uh, prescription numbers. A lot of these pharmacies have seen the prescription numbers go, but also footfall and also people coming availing themselves of private services. Um, at the expense of perhaps of some of those around uh, health centres. Yeah, I think there's a question about pre-reg training. Yeah. That's all changing and I don't know how it's changing. 
I don't think there's going to be a pre-rent year, is it? It's going to be incorporated into a fifth year. Am I correct? It, there, there are changes, yeah, but but I think I think um, now it's still it's still going to be the year, isn't it? Right. Well, what I'd say about that one is just just really get yourself involved. Um, you know, make yourself make yourself known to the pharmacist, your tutor that you want to you want to learn plenty, and ask if there's any up and coming courses. Um, send a request to the local pharmacy committee and get on our mailing list. And then you can see what courses are happening in the in the coming year. And um, some of those at the moment will be online. And um, but you know we're hoping to get face to face training back back very soon. So you know join up the LPC mailing list and you'll see what's happening in our in our community. And um, get registered with the local council so you can do um, some of their training um, like brief alcohol interventions and basic stop smoking training. And sign up with public health so you can see what interventions are happening, um, and you know get your local public health knowledge up to date. So just you know do everything really in your pre register any training course you can sign up to, get yourself on because it's all experience and it's all networking. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'm I'm just going to have to pick one or two questions because we, we seem to be having a few coming in. Uh, there's a question from Terry here. Do you think IT is playing, will play a big role in community pharmacy services? Sammy? Yes, yes, I, I think it is already. Um, and I think it will continue to. Um, and I think um, the pandemic has kind of accelerated that quite a lot. Um, and, and, and changes within the NHS are changing. I mean, there's, a, there's an NHS digital department now. So I think technology is going to increase. I mean, we already know doctors are now seeing people um, uh, virtually. Um, we can see pharmacies eventually doing that as well. So yes, I think technology will will have a massive impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I wonder, C Catherine, Catherine has got one. I wonder if you, if you could each just give give a very brief, ah. brief answer to this. It says, what advice would you offer the students about to embark on their career? Um, so this is after pre-reg, I guess. So, um, and they, they don't like taking advice from academics. <laughs> Keep your mind open. Be aware of what's going on around you, and if you think you've got an opportunity, grab it. And don't be afraid to just have a go. I mean, ah. some of the some of the things that you do aren't necessarily what you went out set out to do, but actually there will there are opportunities everywhere, and it is just grasp. You've got your bedrock of education from Sunderland and, and grasp the opportunities that are out there. Yeah. And if, um, you know, don't don't be afraid if you've got ideas and you, you think you've got some, um, you know, some ways you can help with the service or ways you can help in, in localities. Don't be afraid to speak out because some of the some of the ideas come from newly qualified and very, you know, very fresh pharmacists. You know, we're always keen for to, for to learn from you guys as well, because you've got a totally different outlook to us. So just um, you know, just get in amongst it, and um, we're a nice bunch in the northeast. <laughs> Some are. <laughs> right. So um, Paul, um, he, he's got a question. Um, is 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 there a potential in the market to set up pharmacies in the future? Tony, do you know? Would you would you like to answer that one? Is is? Well, yeah, because things are changing all the time, and. Uh, you know, I mean, there are new towns being built. There are, um, you know, there are super GP practices. And I, I think that we've been so obsessed with prescription numbers, but our, the five-year plan at the moment is to try and make us less dependent on prescription numbers and to move to more uh, clinic, clinical services. So, yes, obviously. And I mean, there's all people like me who um, are past the sell-by date and some, you know, just itching for some young person to come and, uh, and kick us out. <laughs> right. Um, right. Okay. We'll have one. We'll have two more questions then, because I think I know I'm very conscious of the time. And being a lecturer, we all, we always stick to time. Uh, what is the typical career progression like for a community pharmacist? Is it necessary to take on a managerial role? Well, I would. I mean. Uh, in answer to that, it's not necessary, um, but I wouldn't shy away from it either. Um, I, I never expected to take on any managerial roles, and I think 
the first part of my career I ended up doing that and, and actually I learned an awful lot which has put me in good stead for many of the things I've gone on to do in the future so I wouldn't shy away from it and I would just see anything that comes your way as an opportunity to learn I mean some of the stuff that you learn in managerial roles does help you to manage patients and staff and and um, it, it's an opportunity don't don't see it as a negative I did in my early years a lot of pharmacists hated the managerial side of things but I think if you see it as a positive and, 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 a, and a, an opportunity you you'll get something from it yeah but if you don't embrace some sort of managerial role you will crash and burn you, you know you <laughs> it's too complicated a business to be in without be, having some element of organization or buying that in um, and uh, it, it, it's naive to assume that you can spurn management and have a successful business. Yeah, okay. right. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually quite quite rewarding as well. It's, it's quite rewarding to be in the same place every day. You know, being a, lo being a locum or mobile is, is attractive in some respect, but it's, it's actually quite rewarding to be in the same place and to be that face that your patients recognise and that's, oh, that's Louise, the pharmacist, and you're, you're managing not only your own, own team, but all of the activity that goes on in your pharmacy. And when you get it right, and you have your systems in place and you have your, your leadership styles, it's really quite rewarding. Yeah, right. Finally then, you've all, you've all done post-grad qualifications. Do you think it's really important for, for pharmacists to, to do post-grad like clinical diplomas and, and independent prescribing? Yes, <laughs> because the, the big thing is that thing is, things are changing so fast, you can either sit there and watch them change you can ignore them and perish because you will be found out if you don't evolve or you can seize it and do something with it you've got yeah. to you've got to keep evolving yeah, yeah. I, th I think i think that's the message that you've given us tonight um, evolution is um, and being involved Right. Well, I think I think we'll have to call call it um, a day now with the questions. So, so thanks um, th thanks to the speakers for for for, for answering the questions, and, and thanks to everybody for for, for giving the questions. There's, there's been uh, um, loads loads of interest. Obviously, um, you, you've provided a, um, a, a a vision of community pharmacy. It's brilliant, and, and it's been so inspiring that um, that 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 hopefully um, anyone who's been listening can't can't resist the thought of going into community pharmacy now and um, and the, the opportunities that it's going to that it's going to give the sort of the future it seems to me very bright after after listening to you tonight and and also it's 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 a bit of work as well though you know i think i think you've got to put the work in don't you so brilliant presentations um just uh, just before we go just to say behind the scenes thanks to um the people that you don't see there's there's alina uh, Lauren and Rachel from the um, alumni development office. They, they've put a lot of work in um, getting this off the ground and going. And um, and and yeah, and and, that, and that's it really. So so thanks everybody. Thank thanks everybody for attending, and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. So thanks. <laughs>